Hello, welcome everyone to another episode of the Virtual Ninja Show. It's actually another special episode in our special incident response mini-series that we have in this um, season number four. My name is Heike, I will be your host, and I have one of our rock stars back. I have Michael Malone back. Please introduce yourself for those that don't know you yet. Hello, everybody. My name is Mike Malone. I'm with the Defender Experts for XDR uh, service in Microsoft. I'm one of the threat hunters in the team. Yes, and that's why you are on this show again, because we're talking about incident response and how to, in this CM episode, how to investigate a malware on an endpoint. But before we get there, I think we wanted to discuss a little bit about what's important when you think about incident response. Um, and yeah, where do we start, Michael? Yeah, absolutely. So there's a uh, there's an acronym that I like to use when talking to people about incident response and the things you track and follow. I call them the ABCs of incident response. Essentially, they're the elements that you need to pay attention to. They're going to be your pivot points as you're going through the incident. They're going to be the things you're going to probably want to recover or, or remove, for example, malware, or maybe you have to reset a user's password. So the trick I use is the ABCs of incident response. So you have authentication, backdoors, communication channels, and data. So shouldn't, shouldn't this be ABCDs? <laughs> where, where did you leave the D out? <laughs> yeah, so we can, we can do the ABCDs. It's, uh, it, it kind of flew off the tongue a little bit easier as ABCs. So the idea here, so authentication is anything identity related. So any type of uh, incident you're going to have is going to have some concept of identity. It could even be anonymous. That could be the identity in question. Uh, so it's going to be users who create processes, the identity, the email uh, sender that sent the phishing email to you. It's going to be the user account that the attacker has stolen is moving around the network in. It might be a, an account that the attacker created as a backdoor capability. The backdoor aspect of it is essentially the mechanism that an attacker uses to control the, the compromised system. So this is going to be, for example, this could be a legitimate capability like a remote desktop protocol or BNC that just happens to be overexposed or maybe the attacker's already in and they're controlling it that way. This could also be things like malware. So you might have something that's uh, a piece of malware in your machine that's allowing the attacker to control and interact with it without your, obviously, your intent to provide them that. The communication aspect is the path between the attacker and the back door. So essentially, this is going to be the remote resource that the attacker connects to or from to control it. So in a piece of malware, if this is what we call a reverse shell, something that calls out to the Internet to take commands, it's going to be the DNS name that it's connecting to to get its commands. Mm -hmm. If it's in the case of like we talked about remote desktop protocol or BNC or something along those lines, it's going to be the remote IP address that's making the inbound connection. And the last one is data. The purpose of data in this whole thing is to describe impact and intent. So we're going to be looking at anything that the attacker may have compromised the confidentiality, integrity, and or availability of as a result of the incidents you're investigating. Mm -hmm. Would this also apply, of course, to ransomware where data then is encrypted, right? So this is just another aspect of what has been done with data. Exactly. Yeah. So in ransomware, essentially what you have is you lose the data's availability or to be most technical, it's utility. You can't actually read the data because you no longer have a key to the data unless you're able to recover it in some way, shape or form. And then not specific to any incident, but all incidents. So the ABCDs is also uh, like a little bit of a process of how you go through it? Or are these the four things that you're looking after for in non a specific order? For every alert that you're digging into, every every event, you could say, there's there's actually three time frames. So you're going to see the ABCs in all of them, ABCDs, if you will, in all of them. So you, for the initial connection, so how the attacker initially connects to the compromised system, or the system they intend to compromise, so there's going to be a potential identity there. In in the case of our remote desktop hypothetical situation, there's going to be an IP they came from. There's going to be a backdoor, which is your legitimate capability that was overexposed. 
and a communication channel where they came from. There's not really data at this point because they're not reading any information from a desktop. Maybe you might say the an overexposure might leak your system name amount, but that's going a little far. There, the next one is post breach. So post breach is the is the information the attacker operates after that initial connection. So let's talk. Let's change it up. We'll talk about a web shell. So in a web shell situation, you typically have a vulnerable web application or something that essentially is hosting malicious code that you didn't intend to be there. So in a web shell, the attacker is going to connect essentially to a website, probably your public facing website of some sort. And then they're going to have illegitimate code running on that device performing their actions. So in that case, the identity they're performing, they're working as is the identity of the web server. The back door is the web shell that they've put onto the system that allows them to control it. And the communication channels, which is the IP address you're seeing in the web log. So, and the data in that case, uh, so post breach is, would be anything that, that they might be able to expose as a result of that. And the mm -hmm. last one is going to be what I call impact. So that's saying as a result of this condition, you're going to potentially lose identities. So we're going to say credentials may be compromised. Uh, there may be new capabilities the attacker can route to that they couldn't before. And there's a new communication path between the machine that they've compromised and that, and that, that path. So that destination. And then ultimately data. So did they steal information? Did they destroy information? Did they tamper with information? So that's the, that's actually the three timeframes and how they map over to the ABCs. So, and those are the four things that you would recommend someone to look for basically the evidence or the entities, right? So what authentication has been used, user or what you just mentioned, what backdoor community, so that you get a full understanding of what's happening. And if you miss a piece, you need to look for that piece, right? <laughs> exactly, yeah, they're, they're all there. And uh, interestingly enough, if you look at the Defender incident graph, it's the things, it's, many of them are what we pivot off of inside of Defender. Before you dive in there, Michael, maybe when you already mentioned the incident, let's hop in the portal and show people how that looks like. Absolutely. Yeah, let's go ahead and take a look at an incident in the Defender portal, and I'll kind of show you how the ABCs map out. And we'll use them to actually do an investigation. Now, the best place, in my opinion, to see the ABCs is the homepage on the incident, because ultimately what we're seeing here is we're seeing IP addresses. There's a communications. We've got files. These could potentially be backdoors. They could also be data, potentially. We've got identity. There's your authentication, the user accounts. We've got devices. The devices would host the backdoors, essentially, in this scenario. Ultimately, what we're seeing is the interrelationship between the ABCs as it relates to the incident, which is one of the reasons why this is such a popular view, is if you dig into it, it's going to tell you all the main things you need to think about pivoting off of. And this is going to be typically where you start your investigation, where you start digging into what things do I need to focus on? Yes. I had a, the first show. If someone missed the first episode, go watch it. I talked uh, with Oren about this. And I love the play button that actually shows you what happened step by step. So you actually see exactly um, the individual thing. As a, yes. Absolutely. Yeah, it's great because that, that, that actually solves the other half. So when you're doing your investigations, you're typically building what we call an entity relationship graph, which is how these things are tied together, which is what we're seeing. And the second half is the chronology or the timeline, if you will, of how things play out over time. And putting those two pieces together is when one of the things that makes this really powerful. Thank you first for walking us through the ABCDs. Um, and... Now let's, I don't know if we map them actually to our incident that we are going to investigate today, but let's share with us what's our story and what are we going to investigate um, specifically. Absolutely. So in this case, this is, a, this is a slightly complex incident. So we've got multiple devices, we've got multiple users, we've got communication channels that are going on here, a whole bunch of different stuff. So let's go ahead and pop over to the alerts and I'll talk to you about how the ABCs fit into here and then how we're going to use it to, to answer the story of how did this whole thing come about. Under impacted assets, you're going to see we have the systems and the usernames hanging out here. I've got these sorted right now by last activity and descending order. So let's go towards the beginning of this, and we're going to see how this whole thing started up. 
So inside the alert, you're going to see everything is tied to a specific context. And essentially what we've got here is we've got machine 003 and we've got a user corp slash gym charge that's, that's, that's running on it. So these two things are the context that this entire alert story is in. One of the cool things we released in Defender a couple of years ago now is we actually pull all of the alerts and all the process trees together when it's the same context. So you're going to see multiple different alerts in here, even though we may have clicked on a specific alert, it's going to tell you everything that it saw around the same time that it used the same device, same user, authentication, and the host for a potential backdoor of our, our device here. So as we dig into here, you're going to see a whole bunch of interesting activity. So we've got, let's start up here towards the top. We've got a MS Sense S application hanging out here. So in this particular case, this is a suspicious looking application. If we dig into it a little bit further, we can start figuring out its prevalence. So we don't see it's, it's not detected by anybody in virus total today. We can also see it's not assigned files. These are all things you typically look at when you're looking at a potential backdoor, a potential piece of malware. Is it signed? What's the PE metadata? So this is the information that the software manufacturer compiles into the executables when they produce it. There is none here. It's only found on one device and one in the world. And it was first seen not too terribly long ago. So a lot of things make this very interesting. It, it speaks to me that it might be something tailor-made, if you will, something unique. It could be something only in your organization. It could be something built specifically for your organization by an adversary. I love the prevalence, especially worldwide and in your organization. So you really get a good sense of Wow, this is out there 500,000 times, so probably not a problem. Or like, not a problem, but not something targeted to your organization, right? Yeah, and that's a very good point. So there's, and the other thing that's worth, worth noting here is, so right now we're looking at a suspicious executable. But you'll also see we've got PowerShell down here as running some kind of funny business as well. So there's really three different scenarios you can encounter. You can have a malicious binary, something that there's no legitimate purpose for. You can have a benign binary that's issued a malicious command, such as PowerShell running a malicious script. And you could also theoretically have a benign binary with a benign command that has malicious intent. So you may use an off-the-shelf proxy application to route a connection out of your network into an attacker's system. So that would be an example of a benign application, benign parameters for it, malicious intent behind it, or we would call a lolvin. So digging into this, so we can already pull out a couple of things here. So you're normally in device investigation, you're pivoting between the entity relationship and then the timeline. So the question becomes right here, where did this come from? And then what happened after it arrived? So when you're investigating any incident, you're going to pivot typically between an entity relationship approach. So what's tied to what? What are the ABCs and how are they interrelated to this thing I'm looking at right now? And a timeline approach. In the timeline approach, you're going to be looking for where did it come from and where did it go? So let's go ahead and jump into a timeline. We'll cheat over here. We're going to go ahead and use this feature. So I can hit the, on any alert, I can jump to see in timeline. That's going to bring me over to the device page and put me right at the timestamp where in this case, this is a device investigation, right where that happened. Over here, I can see we have some suspicious scheduled tasks process launched. Let's go ahead and look back a little bit, see if we've got any other activity around here. So we've got some flags. So one of our incident responders has actually gone through here and found some interesting stuff already. We've got a work app too that becomes interesting. You see that because they added some flags, right? So you, that's why, I'm, why you're saying there was already someone investigating that incident? Exactly, yeah. So in this case, we've, got, we've had somebody go through here in our team and they've actually flagged specific things. So the neat thing here is with the device timeline, you can flag things arbitrarily, and then anybody who looks at the device will see that flagged event. So they can say, hey, this is something that somebody on my team said was interesting. Now, this rather suspicious looking MSSense.exe, if you scroll back a little bit, we can actually see it was created by an application called WorkApp2.exe. So once again, this is showing we've got a potential backdoor in the mix here. WorkApp2, if we were to dive into it, Let's go ahead and jump into the file page real quick and see what it looks like. So that one file created another file, like work app created MS Sense S. Correct. Okay. Work app two is another one we've got. So we've seen a few of them in the world, only on two devices inside the organization. 
So this is also an interesting file, in my opinion here. We don't have any metadata in here. We do actually have 20 detections for that file in virus total. So now this immediately becomes of interest. So now we got to figure out where did it come from? What are the ABCs associated with that? And then where did it, what happened after? So we already know that this file, which is flagged as malicious, it has created MSNs S. So now we're kind of changing our perception on MSNs S. We're pretty much saying this is almost definitely bad now if a piece of malware mm-hmm. creates it and it's unique. So the ABC is in here. So the, uh, the best way to get into this, in my opinion, is advanced hunting. So Michael, so you are applying the ABCs to every um, evidence that you find over and over again. Correct. So if we take a look over here under work app two, so we're going to have, so the authentication in this case is the identity it was running under. So we've mm-hmm. got this, this work app two was launched by, where's our user account? Ah, uh, there it is. Corp Jim chart. So there's the authentication mechanism right now. Mm-hmm. The backdoor aspect, we haven't quite figured out yet. We got to figure out what caused work app to, to launch. So that's an important mm-hmm. note as well. So there's tools, there's malware, and then there's also remote access Trojans or persistence mechanisms. So anything that an attacker needs to rely on, they want to persist. You want to create a, a scheduled task that runs it. You want to create a run key, you register it as a service. Something has to start it, otherwise you lose control. And persistence. Exactly, persistence. So at this point, we don't actually know yet where this file came from and how it launched. We can tell from over here it came from, looks like from service host, which is kind of interesting. I think the jury's still out on this particular file, though, here. We can go back in the timeline and figure out, uh, we can actually do a quick search up here. We do work app two. Just hit enter. We should be able to see where this file came from. So scrolling all the way back to the end of the timeline. So we've got a work app two connected to, this is actually uh, in the background. This is our uh, network protection is validating the URL in this guy. So at the very beginning, we're seeing that we've got a network connection, but more importantly, we're seeing MS Edge renamed work app two. This implies to me that this, this was probably downloaded from the internet somewhere. Uh, if we take a look at the folder where this is at, Sure enough, this is in C users gym charge downloads work app 2.exe. So the combination of MS Edge doing this rename, so typically when Edge downloads something, it downloads as a temp file and then it renames it once the download's complete. So I can say that this was not persistent necessarily. It was probably downloaded by this user. So there's had to be something that tricked this user into downloading this file, which is inherently mm-hmm. malicious. But then you still need to execute it. Correct. So this is, uh, and that's the next thing we see up here is we see work app two is blocked as untrusted by smart screen. So smart screen kicked in and told the user, you probably don't want to run this. And Jim said, I want to run that. <laughs> like all good users do. <laughs> yeah, so it looks like our user actually downloaded this from somewhere and then renamed it uh, and then launched it, bypassed smart screen and all the warnings we were putting up and still ran it anyways under their identity. So using our ABCs now, the identity here is we've got the user Jim Charge. The mechanism, somehow Jim Charge was led to get this file. We don't at the immediate moment know what that was that led Jim to do that. And the communication path would be essentially the path where Jim pulled this down and downloaded it from, the URL it came from. Let's go ahead and see if we can figure out where this came from. One of the cool things you can do with Defender is you've got advanced hunting. So if we pop open advanced hunting, and we've got something rather unique like work app two, we can see everything that has to deal with that particular file. And I'll give you the laziest way to do it, search. <laughs> Woo. So if we just search for the word work app two, .exe, it's gonna search everything that we have, and let's go ahead and put an order. So we do order by, Timestamp. So we should see two devices. It was seen two times, two devices. And then lots of events. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so as it comes, so when this comes up, it'll, it's basically gonna look everywhere we see the, the string work app to, put it in chronological order for us. So we should be able to see if there's any other uh, tables that might have work app to in it. 
So let's go ahead and scroll down here towards the beginning a little bit and see what we start seeing. We're seeing image loads, which means it loads something into memory. We're seeing there's alerts tied to it. So we got a suspicious process discovery. So we've got, it's doing some pretty interesting stuff. What's interesting here to me though, is we've got a URL click event. So now URL click event is not a defender for endpoint table. That's actually a defender for office table. And what we're seeing is that work app two was hosted on this URL, this web server over here, web serve corp threat CTF com work app two. That's interesting because that implies that the path to the exe was inside of an email. Now we know that this user downloaded it from edge, tying that together back to the URL we might be able to tie together that this particular email was from them. So, and if you take a look at the user who's associated with that particular URL, it's Jim Charge. So, but you need to know <clears throat> that a URL click event is part of Office because I can also click on a link in Edge, which is again an endpoint thing. So another ABC for everyone is get your table memorized or what is the recommendation? Like no how things are connected. <laughs> yeah, that's part of the whole XDR story. It's really handy to be able to tie all these things together. Uh, so like from this, the next thing I'd be checking for from a communication perspective, because this is going to be a URL, so this is a communication path, is so where else do I see this URL in the environment? Do I see yes. other emails that have it? Do I look in device network events and see network connections to this DNS name? If it's hypothetical, if it was a malicious DNS name or URL. Yeah, and maybe even if it's just the subdomain and we need to look at the top domain and whoa, now we are getting there. Exactly. <laughs> so so if we, if we if we step back for a second and see the stuff we've already pulled out of this, We've got Work App 2, we've got MS Census, which you can search by name or by hash because they're pretty unique. We've got a potentially compromised user, Jim Charge. We've got a communication path here, this web server. We've got the fact that there's an email associated with it. So there's going to be an email sender. That's going to be an identity, essentially. In this case, that's a form of authentication. So mm -hmm. all of these are how you put that story together with the ABCs. Everywhere you go, you're going to start seeing authentication methods, backdoors, communication channels, and data. Uh, and that together tells the story of what happened in the incident. And ultimately, what do you have to reclaim or clean up? So already I can tell you without even digging into this, that if Work App 2 is indeed malicious, which it looks like it is, I'm going to want to clean that up anywhere it's at. MS Sense S, if it came from Work App 2, it's highly suspect. Uh, in fact, if, if if you dig into the MS Sense S, we only had, we only saw it once in the organization and zero worldwide, so it seems very fishy here. Correct, yeah, and that's then we also saw uh, MS Sense S uh, reference a URL when it launched it, so that was that becomes of interest. That's a potential communication path. That's a, that's how MS Sense S might be communicating with something else. So that URL, if it's not uh, benign, like something out of the box for an application, uh, is something else you can pivot off of. That becomes a communication channel for that. So MS Sense S, is this not also our own exit that we have for Defender for Endpoint? So MS, the We're name not MS... We're people now to go and delete that, right? That's what I'm just checking. <laughs> So, so no, yeah, no, it's we're not asking you to delete sense. MS Sense S in this case is sort of masquerading as a defender process. It actually is not a defender process. I just want to make sure people don't go and hunt for MS Sense and delete it now in all the boxes. So yeah, please, do, please don't delete MS Sense in your on your on your defender uh, protected boxes. That would not be a good thing. <laughs> good. <laughs> This particular MS Sense S is also in a rather uh, interesting location. If, I, if if you notice, it's being launched from C users public. So that also raises the hackles. That makes you wonder, you know, like this is Defender doesn't live in the public user profile. That doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. This is a common tactic that you see uh, adversaries use. Like you'll see them mimic legitimate binary names like Notepad or LSAS or something like that. MS Sense in this case, or something similar to it, because it makes the user think it's a trusted or normal process. Mm. So I think I have two questions, probably more. We saw it came in via email. So of course we could look into how many other people might have received the email, but maybe not clicked 
on the link, right? Or like downloaded it. Who sent it? Mm -hmm. What did it do? Like what happened now? Like and we know it's me, but um, did it do anything malicious? Yeah, so that's the second piece of the of the of the timeline, uh, and we would have to. This this incident is actually pretty complex in here. So we get into if you start digging into it, we can see that there's a connection to a domain controller. We're seeing uh, a folder or file called system associated with it. Uh, let's go ahead and expand out these guys. We don't have our similar nodes. We've got a whole bunch of interesting things going on. From a domain control perspective, we're, we're on DC. We're seeing access to shadow copies which is kind of suspicious. That's a common way you use to get a file that has an active handle on it if you have backup permissions. We see some NetSH activity going on over here on the machine, which NetSH is an inbox application that you can use to manage network configurations and the firewall and such. So from an impact perspective, we would have to, we'd have to dig into all of these guys here in order to tell the entire story. There's a lot to be told. The, the challenge when you're dealing, especially with a determined human adversary, is what the attacker does is entirely up to them. It's not going to be encoded in the in the in the file that you see inside your network. So what we can what I can tell you is that Jim Charge's user account is probably compromised. You can't really trust Machine 003 because it's running under somebody else's uh, somebody else's uh, control right now. There's a piece of malware running on it. We're seeing links to domain controllers and suspicious things that appear to I mean, we're seeing ntds.dit, which is the Active Directory database, which implies if that is truly correlated to this, the attacker has obtained admin to a domain controller. So from an impact perspective, just looking here, I can tell you that you run, you may have actually lost the credentials for all the users in Active Directory in this particular case. So you basically go and run. <laughs> so <laughs> burn it down. Exactly. Yeah, we're going to be resetting a whole lot of passwords uh, to, to, reclaim, wow. to reclaim this infrastructure. Sorry, Michael, the incident is called multi-stage incident involving execution and exfiltration. So there is actually evidence in some of the alerts, I would assume, that something has been stolen. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, yeah, so we can take a, let's take a look. So we've got, let's find it in here. We got, here's our reading files from Valium Shadow Copies. Mm -hmm. This is credential dump from ntds.dit. This is what we were talking about earlier, stealing the, and then we have a possible data exfiltration over SMB. So this alert over here, if we open this page, what we're seeing is that it looks like we have uh, something that was stolen and copied over SMB. SMB is essentially a network share in most cases. Uh, it looks like we have right there. So we've got a copy of the volume shadow copy that was created of ntds.bit. And then the next step we have is we've got a copy of that file over uh, to, let's see. Uh, so you've got co we're copying it over here to a location C Windows Temp System Hive. So we're actually copying it off uh, locally, so we can so they can access it and then actually trade it. I feel bad for Jim in charge. Um, <laughs> it's not a good day for Jim. It's not. Um, so I mean, again, I I guess it it depends a little bit on how big that environment now is. If you really say okay. Um, I'm going to set up a new domain controller and do everything from scratch, right? Or if you start cleaning up that mess. So the the challenge here is we've got uh, we've got an attacker who appears to have gotten domain admin. They backed up the ntds.dit, so they could masquerade theoretically as any user. They can use uh, they can, they have the KRB TGT credential at that point in time, which means they could do golden ticket attacks. So the first step is severing communication channels, because if you have a communication channel the attacker is using, uh, you can't trust any actions made by something that can communicate over it. You might think you have a full control over it, but it's also possible that you have a device that's not in Defender that was communicating out to it and you didn't see it for some reason or another. So the first step is essentially sever the communication channels so that the malware can't talk back to the host and the attacker can't bypass any protections you might have. Then you start rolling into the into the credential side of it. So resetting KRB TGT, resetting user, resetting domain admin passwords, resetting any known compromised user passwords. Once you have that, at least you have control back over your your identity aspect of it. One, and then at that point you can start saying, let's so we can take off these machines that are compromised. The official recommendation is going to typically be to rebuild the machine because 
you can see all the stuff that the attacker did, but it's entirely possible that you might have missed something um, in the attacker's persistence. They may have made a scheduled task that only runs, let's say, once a year to try and download the malware. So the general recommendation is if a device was compromised with a remote access trojan or a backdoor of some sort, uh, it's usually best to rebuild if possible. And that way, mm -hmm. if it came from a clean version of Windows and you have control over your identity infrastructure, then you can you can you can be confident that it's gonna you're gonna be able to regain control over the enterprise. You know, mm -hmm. there's no surprises hiding there for you. Um, I know that you had your flow um, on investigating that malware, and I know I asked so many questions, and may, I don't know if it inter interrupted your flow. Is there anything that we missed talking about? Anything that you wanted to show that I drove you away? <laughs> yeah, no, it's fine. There's there's a whole bunch of stuff. That's the thing about Defenders. There's so many different things you can dive into. Like one of the cool things is, is Defender does some of the investigation for you with this auto IR feature. Uh, it'll pop up some of these evidence response activities. So if it sees things it can act on, it'll act for you. It'll also try and go beyond just the alert to see if anything else was associated. So that's ultimately what helps build this great graph we've got over here. And then, you know, from the investigation piece, like I said, it, it's taking the pieces that Defender gave you, using them as a starting point, and then looking before and after it to try and figure out what might be related, building that ABC graph. And then when that ball of ABC stops growing, you know it's ready to start doing your recovery. Uh, hopefully you catch the breach early um, and you, then you don't have to worry about a whole bunch of different pivots to dig into. But in this case here, it looks like this admin is going to be working pretty hard for, for the weekend. Mm. And I mean, the beauty, not about the attack, but the beauty about the incident and the view here in Microsoft 365 Defender is that It brings you all the puzzle pieces, many of them already nicely presented. So if you click on that file, you see who is the A, <laughs> maybe who is the B, um, and what's the D. So I think, um, but you as an instant responder, understanding and going through all these uh, entities is the important piece of your job, right? Um, yeah. Absolutely. So that's what that's what we do with here at Defender Experts for XDR is we're meant to help uh, provide a second set of eyes for, for your team. Uh, we've got a whole bunch of really smart people on our team, people with a lot of experience in instant response, uh, senior SOC engineers. And essentially, we're here to help a customer augment their SOC with our capabilities. A second set of eyes using all of the threat intelligence capabilities we have to make sure that we have visibility into any suspicious activity and we can respond on your behalf if you so choose. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So you can also help with recommendations and um, help with response. So, Michael, if people want to learn more about what your team does, do you have any AKA link handy for them? Absolutely. Yeah. So if you want to learn more about Defender Experts for XDR, just go to HTTPS, AKA dot MS slash Defender Experts for XDR. Uh, we've got a bunch of documentation there and we're here to help your team if, you're, if, you, if you'd like assistance. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So I think, Michael, um, we caught the malware. <laughs> so um, not a good case, but super interesting to investigate and learn how, about how to use the ABCDs, what to look for, how these things are connected. I mean, you lost me sometimes. You know, I'm not an incident responder, but um, I think it's an amazing, uh, interesting job um, that you have and many out there and hopefully everybody learned something. So again, Michael, thank you so much for being, for having been another time my expert on the show. And for everyone out there, I hope you really enjoy our mini series about incident response here during our Ninja show. I hope to see you soon again. Bye.